The first primates emerged around 85 million years ago. At that time, much of the Earth's surface was covered in tropical forests, and early primates were diffused globally. Around 55 million years ago, due to climate change, the tropical broadleaf forests retreated to the equatorial belt, and our primate ancestors from that point for tens of millions of years were located in East Africa. Around 24 million years ago, the common ancestor of the Old World monkeys, as well as the Great Apes, lived in the Great Rift Valley in Kenya. We share common ancestors with the other apes from 24 million years ago to 12 million years ago, all in East Africa. We departed from the orangutan 12 million years ago, from the gorilla 8 million years ago, and from the chimpanzee and bonobo 7.5 million years ago. Around 7 million years ago, in Central Africa, in Chad, the first hominid, Sahelanthropus chadensis, is found. It's estimated to have had a brain case between 320 and 380 cubic centimeters. Sahelanthropus was possibly bipedal, but most likely was primarily arboreal. Six million years ago, we find another possible human ancestor, Aurorin, in East Africa. Aurorin was microdontic and carried traits which would have facilitated bipedal locomotion, although it was also likely primarily arboreal. Its thumb was similar to modern humans. It seems like it may have lived in a dry, evergreen environment. The Mediterranean basin at this time underwent periodic desiccation between 5.96 million years ago and 5.33 million years ago, the Strait of Gibraltar periodically closed off due to sea level change, and much of what is today the Mediterranean Sea was dry land. The last opening of the Strait of Gibraltar occurred 5.33 million years ago, and that is known as the Zanclean Flood. The fauna of the late Miocene was similar to that which exists in Africa today. There was, however, the Pelagornis, a 75-pound bird that hunted fish, and crocodiles far larger than we see today. The next likely human ancestor is Artipithecus. This genus is divided into two known species, Kadaba and Ramidus. Both lived in the Afar Depression in Ethiopia, which will turn out to be a breeding ground for several hominid species. Artipithecus had a brain capacity somewhere between 300 and 350 cubic centimeters, more heavily prognathic than modern humans, although its jaw did not protrude as much as modern chimps. Its canines were also smaller than modern chimps, and the genus saw less sexual dimorphism, which may indicate less violent competition between males and more pair bonding. It was broadly omnivorous, and it retained a big toe which was suitable for tree grasping. It lived in woodlands, grasslands, lakes, swamps, and springs. And while Artipithecus is contested as a human ancestor, its teeth are similar to that of Sahelanthropus, which strengthens the case for Artipithecus's descent therefrom. I'll share now a theory that I heard, the aquatic ape hypothesis, and this is meant to explain why Homo sapiens has several traits which distinguish it from the other primates. Other primates do not swim. Other primate species have more body hair. Other primate species do not have the subcutaneous fat that we have. Their fat is within a layer of muscle. The traits that set us apart are traits that we have in common with animals like elephants and hippos, which themselves have aquatic ancestors. There is also the fact of our webbed fingers and the streamlining of our body, which is amenable to travel through aquatic environments. If the aquatic ape ancestor hypothesis is accurate, the period of Artipithecus or the later Australopithecus is a likely time frame for that occurrence. On which note, the first species of the genus Australopithecus is Anamensis and that is found 4.2 million years ago in the Turkana Basin in Kenya, which, like the Afar Depression in Ethiopia, is going to turn out to be a breeding ground for many hominid types. The Anamensis had the largest canine among all hominids. It most likely lived in closed woodland canopies with some forays into the savanna. Like Artipithecus, Australopithecus Anamensis also likely spent a part of its time in the trees and a part of its time bipedal. The next species of Australopithecus is Afarensis, found between 3.9 million years ago and 2.9 million years ago, 
This is the species of the famous Lucy specimen. Afarensis is found as far afield as Chad in Central Africa and South Africa. Afarensis is slender and more gracile than Anamensis, and it is found to the south of the Turkana Basin in the aforementioned Afar Depression. The brain capacity of the Afarensis was likely between 380 and 430 cubic centimeters. And there is good evidence that Afarensis did utilize stone tools for the purpose of carving out meat from carcasses. Afarensis had a greater degree of sexual dimorphism than the earlier Ardipithecus. Between 3.5 million years ago and 3.2 million years ago, Kenyanthropus platyops is a debated human ancestor and taxonomic distinction, which had a flatter face than the Australopithecines, it was also found in the Turkana Basin, and most likely spent more time walking in grasslands than the early Australopithecines. This would be a good time to mention that when we find multiple closely related species occupying the same territory, the possibility is always there of admixture and interbreeding. And the fact that Kenyanthropus has several features which resemble modern humans more closely than do those of the Australopithecines, Kenyanthropus may be a portion of our descent along with Australopithecines and later hominids. And the longest lived species of Australopithecus was Africanus, that is found primarily in South Africa with a brain case of approximately 485 cubic centimeters. Africanus was slenderer and more gracile than the earlier Australopithecines. The next genus we'll encounter is the Paranthropus, which some argue should be more properly termed robust Australopithecines. I will use the designation Paranthropus. The first species is Ethiopicus, found 2.5 million years ago in Kenya. The next is Robustus, found 2 million years ago in South Africa. And then the last and longest lived is Boise, between 2.3 million years ago and 1.2 million years ago in Kenya and Tanzania. Paranthropus lived in a dry environment. It was a specialist masticator and most likely vegetarian. Its brain capacity was larger than the Australopithecines, between 500 and 550 cubic centimeters for the species Boise. The males on average were four feet, six inches tall, females four feet, one inch tall. And the first undisputed member of the genus Homo is Havilis, found 2.5 to 1.5 million years ago in both Kenya and Tanzania. It has a flatter face than the Australopithecines, which I would argue is likely partly inherited from Kenyanthropus. It developed the Oldowan stone tool industry, which includes implements for chopping, scraping, and pounding. Its brain capacity was between 550 cubic centimeters and 687 cubic centimeters, possibly according to some estimates as high as 800 cubic centimeters. Homo habilis lived in a time when much of the dense forest of East Africa was being replaced by savanna, and they were common prey of the Dinophilus, a large saber-toothed cat. Homo habilis cohabitated with Paranthropus boise for hundreds of thousands of years. Around 1.9 million years ago in Kenya, there is another species of Homo similar to habilis called Rudolfensis, although the differences are perhaps not great enough to term it a different species altogether. Perhaps this is best looked at as another racial type of the early Homo. And 1.8 million years ago, for the first time, we find Homo erectus. And the first find of that species is not in Africa, but rather in Georgia, in the South Caucasus region. Homo erectus georgicus, the early Georgian specimens, had a smaller brain capacity than the Homo erectus which followed. Homo erectus georgicus averaged 600 cubic centimeters. And at this point, I would like to also mention another possible interbreeding event, which I have not found proposed elsewhere. And that is motivated simply by my comparing the fossils of Paranthropus boise with those of the early Georgian Homo erectus. We know that the ancestor of Homo erectus was living in East Africa with Paranthropus boise 
if the one species made it to the Southern Caucasus region, I don't see why the other could not as well, and this would explain the much smaller brain capacity of the Georgian Homo erectus than those that follow. After Georgicus, the early Homo erectus and Homo ergaster, which is really just African Homo erectus, had a brain capacity of 850 cubic centimeters. Homo erectus dominated for over a million years, and towards the end of its reign, the average brain capacity was 1,100 cubic centimeters, overlapping the range of modern humans. Homo erectus was more orthogonal, less prognathic than previous members of the genus Homo, and it was much taller at 5 foot 10 inches. It was less sexually dimorphous than the Australopithecines, but more sexually dimorphous than modern humans. Homo erectus arguably used fire to prepare meals, and they were the first official hunter-gatherers. Homo ergaster in Africa developed the Aculean tool industry, which featured more symmetrical and better crafted hand axes. These reached India 1.5 million years ago, indicating a migration before that time from Africa to the Indian subcontinent. Other branches of Homo erectus did not pick up the use of the Aculean tool industry despite its superiority, indicating that certain branches of Eurasian Homo erectus did not have contact with later African migrations. One member of Homo erectus is called Meganthropus, and he was located in Java and reportedly grew to be up to eight feet tall and interestingly cohabitated this region with the infamous Gigantopithecus. Both of these primate groups are often mentioned by Bigfoot conspiracy theorists. The earliest known carving, which appears on a shell, is also found in Java around this same time period 500,000 years ago. And the first confirmed example of a hominid crossing from Anatolia to southeastern Europe is Homo erectus around 1.2 million years ago. Homo erectus in Europe around 1 million years ago evolved into Homo antecessor. Antecessor possibly practiced cannibalism, and a 400,000 year old femur from Spain of this species reveals closer genetic ties to the Denisovan than to the Neanderthal, which lends credence to the theory that the Denisovan is another regional development from the Homo erectus. Homo antecessor stood on average between 5 foot 6 inches and 6 feet tall. Its brain capacity was between 1,000 and 1,150 cubic centimeters on average, and it was more robust than the subsequent Homo heidelbergensis. On which note, the Homo heidelbergensis lived between 600,000 years ago and 250,000 years ago in Africa and Europe, although most of the fossils are found, at least presently, in Europe. The first undisputed find is in Germany. The average brain capacity of heidelbergensis is between 1,100 cubic centimeters and 1,400 cubic centimeters again, overlapping the range of modern humans. Males on average of the species were 5 feet 9 inches tall, females were 5 feet 2 inches tall. And there are reports of giants of the Homo heidelbergensis species between 500,000 and 300,000 years ago in South Africa, which incidentally is the time and place of the first spears used for hunting. There is evidence of ritual burial from Spain among Homo heidelbergensis and the use of red ochre for ornamentation from France. And before I move on to Heidelbergensis' famous descendant Neanderthal, I will mention Rhodesiensis, which is found in Africa from 300,000 years ago to 125,000 years ago. The only examples of brain capacity I could find for this species were 1,230 cubic centimeters and 1,100 cubic centimeters. Rhodesiensis had the largest brow ridges of any hominid, and it was, like Homo antecessor, robust. And many of you will be familiar with Homo neanderthalensis, or as it is also known, Homo sapiens neanderthalensis. It is now essentially undisputed that we do have Neanderthal admixture. Neanderthal lived between 250,000 years ago and 30,000 years ago, across Europe and through Siberia to the Altai Mountains, and as far south as the Indus River and 
Palestine. Neanderthal developed the Mosterian tool industry, had an average brain capacity of 1600 cubic centimeters, the largest of any hominid except for the Cro-Magnon man. Male Neanderthals stood on average 5 feet 6 inches tall, females stood 5 feet 1 inch tall. There is evidence of ritual burial, ornamentation using feathers, and there is also evidence that they included cooked vegetables in their diet. The total population across their habitable range was likely no larger than 70,000 individuals. So African Homo sapiens outnumbered Neanderthal 9 to 1. Neanderthal also lived in smaller social groups than African Homo sapiens. A 2007 genetic study revealed that Neanderthal likely had red and blonde hair and light skin. Neanderthal did use boats, and there is evidence of their habitation on Crete, as well as other Mediterranean islands. A Ukrainian site from 44,000 years ago, which may have had some cro manian influence, furnishes an example of a dwelling constructed from mammoth bones which was 26 feet in diameter. According to genetic studies of one population in Spain, the females of the Neanderthal married out into other tribes, meaning a preservation of the gens. And Homo sapiens. Homo sapiens sapiens developed around 200,000 years ago in Africa, although as has been made clear hopefully at this point, there have been numerous instances of admixture between what were thought to have been separate human lineages. So while we can trace our ancestry back to Africa at a certain point, you have ancestors most likely from Eurasia going back hundreds of thousands of years. Many of us know of the first confirmed admixture between Neanderthal and Homo sapiens, which led to the Aragnation culture, which I will cover in my next video in this series. But I would like to mention what may have been a precursor to that later development, the Skull and Kafsa hominids. They are found between 120,000 and 80,000 years ago in Palestine. When they were first found, they were thought to represent some sort of intermediary form between Neanderthal and Homo sapiens. Both groups did inhabit the area in the relevant time periods, so, so the notion that the skull and Kafsa hominids do represent an admixed stock is not out of the question. They used shell beads for ornamentation, they used red ochre for decoration, and there is at least one example of ritual burial in which a boy of 13 is positioned in a very specific way and holds in his hands the antlers of a very large red deer. Just after the time of the skull and kafsa hominids, we find similar ritualistic and aesthetic behavior from the Blombos Cave in South Africa and Toferalt in Morocco. These sites from somewhere around 100,000 to 70,000 years ago include engraved ochre, engraved bone, widely varied diet, and possible specialization in social organization. And this is where I would depart from mainstream research and put forward the notion that it is possible that this first admixture between Neanderthal and Homo sapiens namely the skull and kafsa hominids, produced a breed of man which was so far above his contemporaries that he was able to establish successful colonies in several locations around the world. Both of these early behaviorally modern African sites are near the coast, and this hypothesis would be, in my opinion, the best way of explaining why these more advanced traditions died out in those locations to be replaced by more primitive peoples. I do entertain theories of breakaway human groups or breakaway civilizations. There are several possible points in our history at which this may have occurred. I've outlined one such point in my An Atlantean Hypothesis video. This would be another possible point. The Skull Kafsa group may have, and I'll admit this is a stretch, retained some level of organization and continued to operate covertly as their contemporaries took the next 60,000 years to catch up. Definitely something to think about. I hope some of this information will be helpful for you. I will continue this series as soon as I can, and thank you for listening.